every now and then I'll do an episode that applies the concept of cultural maturity and the ideas of creative systems theory to then current front page news topics. Cultural mature perspective's primary contribution lies with the big picture, with bringing a long-term systemic vantage to understanding. But in just how it does this, it is often very pertinent to making sense of more immediate concerns. It puts front page news issues in context and helps us grasp what they ultimately ask of us. With this episode, I turn to the COVID-19 epidemic. I've written about it extensively since its beginnings, attempting to provide perspective and guidance where possible. You can find many of those more lengthy articles in the front page news section of the Cultural Maturity blog, culturematurityblog.net. Here I'll touch briefly on three lessons from the pandemic where the importance of culturally mature perspective is particularly pertinent. With each we see capacities that come with cultural maturity's cognitive changes becoming centrally important. The first lesson was the topic of my first article way back at the pandemic's beginning, how powerfully it is teaching us about the importance of bringing mature perspective to the fact of real limits. I've described how our modern age narrative in being heroic denies the fact of real limits. The pandemic has confronted us inescapably with limits to what we can know for sure, at least in advance. It has also humbled us repeatedly with limits to what we can control. On both counts, in having to face limits, we have also had to more directly confront the fact that uncertainty and complexity are real. Other needed new capacities, I've noted. And sometimes we could barely guess what might come next. We have not always heeded these messages, when a, but when all of it has been too much for us and we've responded only with blame or denial, we have paid a high price. In that same article, I highlighted a more immediately personal kind of limit. I alerted, I alerted people that they would likely not be able to do many of the things that they had before found most meaningful, at least for the next year or so. I encouraged people to think consciously about concrete limits that would now exist in their lives and commit to respecting them. I also challenged people to think about how they could live the most powerful and creative lives within those very real constraints to imagine how they might best use their attention and their creative energy. I counseled people that not only would this result in the most rewarding use of the year, it would provide the most effective protection against responding to the virus as we so often do in the face of real limits by feeling deprived or victimized. Personally, I had to accept that two-thirds of the things that had before most given my life meaning would not be options. I realized that writing was what could most be done within those constraints. Two major books that might otherwise not have been completed for many years were the result, including my magnum opus, my magnum opus on creative systems theory. Uh, remember the pandemic year less in terms of deprivation than in relationship to that accomplishment. My situation was more privileged than that of many people whose work depended more on person-to-person -person contact, but the basic principle generally holds up for everybody. The second lesson has to do with the need for foresight and with this for greater responsibility as a species when it comes to major challenges before us. I've noted that the degree of foresight and responsibility that will be needed of us going forward is new and critical. We've all had classes in school on the past on history, but very few of us have had classes on the future, even though the future is the one thing we can affect. We've acted as if COVID-19 were a surprise. 
But I and many other people much more versed in epidemiology than I wrote long ago about the danger of the, of the pandemic at a global, the dangers of pandemic at a global scale and the need for preparedness. As warnings, we had the influenza epidemic a century, a century earlier and numerous frightening scourges more recently, bird flu, swine flu, Ebola, that unfortunately did not get more dangerously out of control. Circumstances such as globalization and planetary warming should make pandemics more frequent in the future. It's reasonable to ask if we did have, have foresight focused classes, just what would they teach? Certainly the skills needed to identify and assess future risks would be core curriculum, risks like those of global disease and many other such risks, often similarly existential, uh, that too often we'd rather ignore. Classes would also emphasize the preparedness needed to, needed to confront such events should they occur, or better, when they occur, because they will. Such future-related priorities are key aspects of the redefining of advancement, redefining of wealth and progress that here, I've argued, lies at the heart of the cultural mature leadership task. And one more. The pandemic is further highlighting a, dyna a dynamic that concerns me deeply that I will be turning to directly in these episodes. The amount of polarization and discord we find today politically and more broadly across society. The topic concerns me enough that I chose to write the second of those two books directly about it. The book is titled Perspective and Guidance for a Time of Deep Discord, Why We See Such Extreme Social and Political Polarization and What We Can Do About It. With issues of every sort, the people today are dividing almost immediately into polar camps. Often with particular issues, it is not at all clear in advance that there is any reason for conflict. All we know is that division will happen eventually and result in absolutist adv advocacy from both sides. The pandemic is serving to highlight these dangers and, and the intractableness of this dynamic. Early in the book, I described my surprise that we might polarize with regard to a concern as minor as wearing masks. Since then, we have seen something similar with regard to vaccinations. This is particularly remarkable given that failing to be vaccinated so clearly puts the person refusing the vaccination at risk. We might have imagined that having a shared adversary, which the virus provided, would have brought us together that it hasn't is significantly troubling. Culture I'm sure doesn't have an answer for getting everyone vaccinated more. It simply confronts us with the real dangers that we see. And for our inquiry in these episodes, it makes the kind of growing up in how we think and act that cultural maturity's changes make possible even more inescapably important and common sense. This is not the last time we'll confront this kind of challenge, and many situations yet before us will almost certainly require an even greater degree of foresight, cooperation, and wisdom. Again, I invite your thoughts and questions. <laughs>